Hello and welcome to this lecture on legal issues in employment selection. Legal issues are incredibly important to HR managers because they influence the records that must be kept on applicants and employees, how and whether employees and applicants are treated fairly, and the means by which the job relatedness of selection tools are identified. Let's get started. On this slide, we discuss some of the major laws affecting employee selection and staffing. Not all the laws, but the major ones. The first one is the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution, which prohibits discrimination on all demographic characteristics and covers all federal government employees. To be clear, an employee of a private sector firm cannot plead the fifth, as they say, when engaged in an issue with their employer. However, if you are employed by the United States federal government, you are afforded due process, which means that a hearing must be held to terminate you, as well as other protections against the acts of the government, which in this case would be your employer. The 14th Amendment is the same as above, plus it expands coverage to state and local governments. So now those employees must be afforded due process amongst other rights. This sort of thing is seen as a job security provision by employees, especially those in employment at will states where private sector employees can be fired at any time for any reason or no reason at all, that is at will. State and local government employees have some protection against those things. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibits discrimination in employment decisions based on race, color, sex, religion, national origin, and most recently added by the U.S. Supreme Court, sexual orientation. And it covers privately owned firms with at least 15 employees, as well as all unions, all employment agencies, and all employers receiving federal assistance not covered are private clubs like Augusta National Golf Club, where the Masters Golf Tournament is held every year. And until recently, women were forbidden from joining the club. It was a private club. The Civil Rights Act of 64 did not apply. The Civil Rights Act of 1991 is essentially the same as above, but it allows for two key upgrades. First, Complainants are allowed a trial by jury, not just a trial by judge. Juries tend to be a little bit more sympathetic with their fellow citizens in regards to workplace discrimination than do judges. Second, it allows for compensatory and punitive damages, and not just back pay as the Civil Rights Act of 64 did. These punitive and compensatory damages are a major improvement to the law. The Age Discrimination in Employment Act, ADEA, Age Discrimination in Employment Act of 1967, prohibits discrimination against persons aged 40 and over, like me. It covers private firms, governments, unions, and employment agencies, 40 and over. The Immigration Reform and Control Act states that persons may not willfully employ aliens not authorized to work in the U.S. and requires that the applicant show proof of such eligibility. However, so as not to discriminate against so-called foreign-looking applicants, it prohibits discrimination based on citizenship and national origin. It covers private firms with four or more employees and all government employers. The Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 prohibits discrimination against applicants or employees who are otherwise qualified with a physical or mental disability that substantially impairs one or more major life activities. It covers private firms, unions, and employment agencies and requires that a reasonable accommodation in the work itself, the work environment, or in benefits and privileges if the person is otherwise qualified. We'll go into much more detail on this on the next slide. So let's move on. 
Here are the key points of the ADA. What is a disabled person? As mentioned, a person is considered to have a disability if they, one, have a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities, two, if they have a record of such an impairment, or three, they are regarded as having such an impairment. Let's explore these three categories in greater detail. A major life activity includes walking, talking, seeing, hearing, feeding oneself, bathing oneself, and a host of other things that the non-disabled person all too often takes for granted. Having a record of such an impairment could include suffering a debilitating injury that left one in a wheelchair for many, many months, but which one no longer uses, or being a recovering alcoholic or drug addict who successfully completed an approved drug rehabilitation program and is now no longer using drugs or alcohol. Now, the last one is the hardest to understand. Think for a moment about someone who suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder. Their PTSD might be bad enough that they require treatment and or drug therapy to get control of their issues, but it is not so bad as to qualify them as disabled. This might be enough that they might be regarded by some as having a disability. Okay, this example might not be as clear as we hoped, but this last category is probably the least frequent of them all and is sort of a catch-all of last resort. Now, the ADA does not cover certain excluded groups like homosexuals and bisexuals, transvestites, transsexuals, pedophiles, exhibitionists, voyeurs, and those with other sexual behavior disorders. It doesn't cover compulsive gamblers, kleptomaniacs, pyromaniacs, and those currently using illegal drugs. A reasonable accommodation is required for qualified individuals unless an undue hardship exists for the firm. However, an otherwise qualified individual must meet the job-related requirements of the position and can, with or without reasonable accommodation, perform the essential functions of the job. An undue hardship involves the nature and cost of accommodation and the ability of the firm to bear those costs. For example, a small mom-and-pop grocery store on the second floor of a Manhattan walk-up probably does not have to install an elevator for a wheelchair-bound applicant or employee simply because of the sheer cost of it. That would be an undue hardship. Let's move on. Many of the laws discussed already are designed to prohibit discrimination in the application process or in any employment decision like firing, promotion, training opportunities, etc. The first main form of discrimination is called disparate impact. It is a form of discrimination that results from a facially neutral or seemingly innocuous test that has the result of discriminating against an entire class of protected citizens. Well, what is a seemingly innocuous test? If we think broadly about any selection tool as a test, we see that an interview is a test. The submission of a resume is a test in that we probably place resumes into three stacks, the yes stack, the maybe stack, and the hell no stack. The test is, which stack does your resume go in? based upon its perceived quality. An intelligent test or personality test are certainly tests. A test is innocuous or potentially harmless if the intention of it is good and decent. Here's an example. We might want our local police officers to be big and strong. Seems reasonable. So we have a test for applicants. They must be six feet tall and weigh at least 200 pounds. Well, that well-intentioned test discriminates against almost all women, many, if not most, Hispanics and Asians, who typically aren't as physically large as white males. In the famous Griggs v. Duke Power case, an African-American male applied for a job as a coal handler in a rural North Carolina coal plant 
in 1960s. The company deemed Griggs as unqualified because he did not have a high school diploma. At that time in rural North Carolina, almost no African Americans had high school diplomas. The test of whether or not one had a high school diploma was discriminatory because an entire class of protected citizens did not meet the criteria. And more importantly, the test was not job related. All employment tests must be job related. A high school diploma did not make one a better coal handler. This requirement was not related to the job, so it was illegal and had the consequence of disparate impact, which is alternatively referred to as adverse impact. Same thing, disparate impact, adverse impact. So if you own or manage a business and are sued because of disparate impact, again, which is often just unintentional discrimination against an entire class of protected citizens, here are your possible defenses. One, you must prove that your requirement is a business necessity. It can't simply be a part of one's business plan, like only hiring cute white girls for your wait staff because your target market is over 60 bald-headed white guys. It must be a business necessity that is limited to the safety of workers or customers. Think about that. So it's probably legal to have height and weight and or experience requirements for your nightclub bouncers because scrawny bouncers can endanger the customers. Two, the requirement not satisfied by the entire class of protected citizens against whom your test discriminates might be a bona fide occupational qualification, or BFOQ. A BFOQ disqualifies certain demographic groups because members of that group simply cannot perform the job. For example, you might place an ad in the newspaper or Craigslist or whatever for a new Lutheran minister at your Lutheran church that says, Jews and Catholics need not apply. That would be legal, but really, really stupid because only Lutheran ministers can be ministers at a Lutheran church. Another example is that men cannot be restroom attendants in women's rest restrooms and vice versa. The only protected class characteristic that can never be a BFOQ are race and color. One cannot use race or color as a BFOQ. Three, you could provide evidence of the validity of the test. This is why companies, well, smart companies, spend a lot of time buying or developing and then validating their selection test. They must be able to show the scores on their test are significantly correlated with job performance. That's what every test is trying to predict, job performance. An interview score must be positively related to job performance. An IQ score must be positively related with job performance. A score of three for getting one's resume in the yes stack, a two for the maybe stack, and a one for the hell no stack must be correlated with job performance. Moreover, the test must be used for plausible reasons. If the test only predicts 1% of the variance in job performance, then it's not likely to be a plausible test. If you want to use personality as a test for stay-at-home teleworkers, that might not be plausible in that the manner and types of interaction with others as it pertains to their personality might not be very useful. However, if a class of protected citizens do not score well enough on a valid test, as in the legal case of Di Stefano v. Ricci discussed later in this lecture, you may have cover. That is, you may be protected against claims of disparate impact because your test is valid. And it's simply unfortunate that one or more protected classes did not perform well enough on it to be hired. Again, though, each test must be job related thanks to Griggs v. Duke Power. The rest of this course is about measuring predictive tests and measuring job performance. This is incredibly useful stuff. Let's move on. So here's how we find out if the possibility of disparate impact exists. Note that this is not proof 
of disparate impact, but only that it may exist. In the previous slide, we discussed three ways that claims of disparate impact may be overcome. Here's one way to find out if they even have a shot at a claim of disparate impact. It's called the fourth this rule, and the possibility of disparate impact exists if the ratio of protected class members selected to non-protected class members is less than four-fifths or 80%, then it might be a problem. Companies are not required to hire or select for determination or promotion or any other employment decision at the exact same rate for protected as for non-protected class members. However, they should select at a fairly high enough rate, that is at least 80% or four-fifths, so as not to discriminate. So here's an example. Say 100 white persons apply for a job at a new factory and we hire half or 50 of them. Their selection ratio is 50% because 50% of them got hired. Now say that 50 black persons applied. Do we have to hire 50% of them? No. In this example though, suppose we only hire 10 of them for a selection ratio of 20%. Well, 20% is not nearly four fifths of or 80% of 50%. Let me say that again. 20% is not four-fifths of 50%. In fact, the selection ratio for blacks is only 40%, not 80%, which is the, you know, the percentile uh, representation of four-fifths. Now, we might have evidence of disparate impact because of this. The company engaging in these practices better have some pretty good reasons for, for such a low selection ratio for black applicants. Let's move on. Disparate treatment is another main type of discrimination and it involves situations in which different standards are applied to various individuals, even though there, there may not be an explicit statement of intentional prejudice. May not is the imperative phrase here. It may or may not be intentional and almost always applies to discrimination against individuals, not against entire classes of citizens like with disparate impact. Disparate treatment exists when an otherwise qualified applicant applies for the job and they think they were denied employment based upon their protected class membership. This is why employers should never ask questions about religion, ethnicity, race, age, etc. These things are not illegal to ask, but if an employer does ask them and then the applicant is not hired, the applicant might perceive that it was their answer about those protected class characteristics that kept them from getting hired. Anyway, as you might surmise, there is a rule of determining if disparate treatment possibly exists or not. And it's called the McDonnell Douglas rule, and it derives from the court case of McDonnell Douglas v. Green. So, in order for a prima facie case to exist, or a case where discrimination exists on the face of it, so to speak, the plaintiff must show four things. First, the plaintiff must belong to a protected class. This is usually quite easy, but not always. Think back to the third type of disability as being regarded as having a disability. That's a little bit easier to uh, figure out. Second, they applied and were qualified for the job for which the company sought to hire. Well, that's easy to show. Third, they must show that they were rejected for selection. Well, that's easy too. Fourth, they must show that the position remained open and the employer continued to seek applicants with the same qualifications as the rejected person who was filing suit. That's fairly easy too. As you can see, none of these requirements is too high of a bar to reach. The best antidote is to not ask stupid questions during interviews and have valid job-related reasons for hiring and not hiring. Let's move on. Executive order statements are made by the President of the United States and have the same purpose as statutes or laws, but they only apply to government and firms doing business with the government, the federal government. 
So if you own a small local barbershop and do not have a government contract of any sort for services or products, then you are not covered by or required to follow an executive order. Now in this case, we're talking about executive order EO 11246, which set up the concept of an affirmative action program and, and prohibits discrimination based on race, color, etc just like Title VII did for most private sector employers with at least 15 employees. Now, federal government agencies and those business with, businesses with federal contracts in excess of $10,000 cannot discriminate on the same protected characteristics covered under Title VII. An affirmative action plan, the key part of EE 11246, specifies actions that an organization must take to actively seek out and remove unintended barriers to fair treatment in order to achieve equal opportunity. Affirmative action is not preferential treatment or the use of quotas in hiring. Instead, it is an addressing of past injustices that require a proactive effort at hiring an appropriate number of members of protected classes. More specifically, it is a written document that explicitly states steps to be taken, information to be gathered, and the general baseline for decision making for each area of HRM and serves as a guideline for actions to ensure that equal employment opportunity principles are implemented within the organization. Now, this is the interesting part. These plans are supervised by the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs, OFCCP, Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs, and not by the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, as Title VII is. So executive orders are supervised by a different government agency or department than is the discrimination issues covered under Title VII. Let's move on. Here are some of the major court cases that pertain to employee selection and staffing. We've already mentioned the Griggs case, for which the key point is that employment tests must be job related. The determination of the job relatedness of a test is one of the main purposes of job analysis. Job analysis is a formal procedure for figuring out what people actually do in their jobs. And as we know, it has two byproducts, job descriptions and job specifications. In the US v. Georgia Power case, similar issues to the Griggs case arose. Georgia Power employees wishing to transfer from black dominated low level jobs like porter and janitor had to have acceptable scores on a battery of tests and have a high school diploma. In the Georgia Power Validity Study, they only included upper level white dominated jobs and found that those indeed had required test scores and high school requirements that were predictive of job performance in those jobs. Their fatal flaw, so to speak, was that they did not include any blacks in, this, in their study even though one third of job applicants were black. So once again, the court struck down the high school diploma requirement because Georgia Power did not conduct a proper validity study. Here's the key, using the proper subjects. In Ricci v. De Stefano, a fire department went to great pains to use a properly validated employment test for promotion purposes. After administering the test, none of the top scorers were black. Indeed, blacks were adversely impacted as their selection ratio was less than four-fifths of whites and Hispanics. So what did these uh, fire department do? They threw out all test scores and no one was promoted because the fire department feared a lawsuit. That is, no whites, no Hispanics, no blacks were promoted. This was despite the incredible evidence of validity that the fire department took to ensure that the test was job related. Then several whites and at least two Hispanics sued and won 
as the tests were determined to be very job related, very valid, and the test scores were properly used for promotion purposes. Of course, there are numerous other legal court cases worth noting, but we just don't have time in this lecture. Let's move on. Regardless of whether the issue is disparate treatment or disparate impact, statistics are used to determine if discrimination is possible. This and the, and the next two slides cover some basic statistics uh, used by HR managers. Uh, the, the next slide, not the next two. Stock statistics compare groups at one point in time. Stock statistics compare groups at one point in time. It determines if the workforce percentage is significantly less, less than the relevant labor market percentage, or RLM. If so, then discrimination may exist. In essence, it compares the percentage of internal and external demographics at any one point in time. So first, we must define the relevant labor market, or RLM. It is an appropriate external comparison group of workers from which one draws applicants and employees. For example, the RLM for fast food workers is usually described by two key group component determinants, geographical location and skill level. Most fast food workers have little or no job skills and live within a short distance of the restaurant. In fact, those two aspects, skills and geographic location of the workforce, determine most of the RLMs for most occupations. For example, the RLM for college professors has a much different required skill level and is usually a worldwide geographical area. In the example here, we're comparing the number of female managers in a firm to the total number of managers in that firm. Let's say that's 60%. We then find out that the number of appropriately skilled female managers in the entire workforce compared to the total number of managers in the entire labor, for, labor force. And let's say that number is 50%. So our stock statistics compare quite favorably. Rarely does one use the entire workforce of the entire world as the RLM. Uh, so much thought and evidence must go into defining the RLM for any one job in any one company. Let's move on. If stock statistics are a snapshot in time, then flow statistics are altogether different. When we compare two proportions taken at two different time points, we are assessing trends. We could also use a flow statistic to compare two different ratios from two different groups. For example, we could use this stat to determine if our selection procedure is problematic by examining the selection ratio both before and after some point in time. Or we could compare, say, a minority group to a non-minority group. For this comparison, the RLM is not an issue of concern. Now, there's almost always going to be a difference. The issue is if the difference is statistically significant enough to be worthy of legal action. So in this ratio comparison here, it should be immediately obvious which test is used. The four-fifths test. So the four-fifths four -fifths test is a special type of flow statistic. It compares one group to another group instead of one group at one time to that same group at another time. Of course, there are more exact statistical tests than just the four-fifths test. One could compare the ratio of observed to expected persons using a variation of the chi-square test known as Fisher's exact test, or one could determine the standard deviation of the distribution of scores, convert test scores to z-scores, and compare z-scores. There are a multitude of different statistical tests that good HR managers must know, but that are a bit beyond the scope of this lecture. We'll spend a ton of time on statistics in later lectures. Again, you have been warned. Let's move on. All this stuff can seem very complicated. It should be. P 
people's work and the quality of their lives and the lives of their families often depend upon legal, fair treatment. So the EEOC and other government agencies have compiled a guiding document to help HR managers do their jobs and keep their companies out of court. This document is called the Uniform Guidelines on Employee Selection Procedures, which is usually just called the guidelines. This is not a set of laws and are thus not legally binding. However, they have saved many an HR manager's job by strict adherence to them. They state the four-fifths rule. They provide various possible defenses to charges of discrimination. They discuss the use of cutoff scores on selection tests. They provide guidance on validating tests and measuring job performance. And they give guidelines on record keeping. Now, as such, they are used quite often in court decisions, and it is highly recommended that HR managers read, understand, and keep a copy of them nearby. Let's move on. Of course, there are other useful sources of information on employee selection. The principles are published by the Society for uh, industrial and organizational psychology, of which yours truly is a longtime member. So we have the guidelines, we have the principles, we also have the standards. The standards for educational and psychological testing are co-published by the American Psychological Association, again, of which yours truly is also a longtime member, as well as the American Educational Research Association, former member, and the National Council on Measurement in Education also a former member. So now we have the guidelines, the principles, and the standards. You should get a copy of each. Let's move on. Well, thanks. That's all, folks.